Well, the title of my message today is called, To Whom Shall We Go? Can you turn to your neighbor and just tell them, To Whom Shall We Go? And while you're doing that, tell them, you look beautiful this morning. Yes. Um, and uh, we're, in, we're finding ourselves in John chapter 6. And chapter 6 is the longest chapter of the book of John, right? It's 71 verses. And as I was praying and I was asking the Lord, God, what is it that you want me to speak on, right? Uh, I, I had John 6 in my mind. But then for some reason, I was just reading 7, chapter 7, chapter 8. I was like, it's so much shorter. God, I'm sure there's something in there, right? But then God just kept putting my heart. Read chapter 6. of like, 71 verses, you know, continues to meditating. And so rather than speaking on the entire chapter, I wanted to focus on the very end. But to give you a little bit of context, this chapter, right, starts off with a crazy miracle, right? And this miracle is crazy because it is, it is the only miracle other than the resurrection and the, de- and the crucifixion of Jesus to be recorded in all four synoptic gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that, go- and that miracle is the miracle of feeding of the 5,000, right? So chapter 6 starts off with this crazy boom, right, of a feeding of 5,000 using one little boy's junior high kid's lunch, right, some bread and some fish, and he feeds over 5,000 people, and there's this crazy amount of crowd that is following following Jesus. But at the end of this chapter, you will see that the 5,000 is, no, is now diminished down to just simply 12. And we're going to see what happens here and transpires and why that happens. And the title, I, I, as I mentioned today, is To Whom Shall We Go? So we're going to jump right in to John chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 60 down to 71, and we'll alternate back and forth. So here we go. John 6, 60. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Got to need a little bit more energy, okay? So you can turn the mic on here so we can kind of have up here. But go ahead and read it out. It's the word of God. Verse 62. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord... To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Seventy-one altogether. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now before I go further, I want to ask you a question, right? What are some of the most memorable one-liners you've ever heard in a movie, right? So let's just kind of think, think back. Some of you guys, movie buffs right here, any movie buffs, right? You love movies. I enjoy movies. I love them as well. Let me, let's play a little game. I'm going to say a line, and you're going to tell me the movie from where that line is from. Ready? Let's try an easy one, right? May the force be with you. Oh, yeah, we've got a Star Wars fan. Okay, next, how about this one? My mama always said... Life was like a box of chocolate. Yes, yeah, some of you guys said the answer before I finished the line. But yes, life was like a box of chocolate. That is Forrest Gump. How about this one? Toto, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Wizard of Oz. Yeah, there you go, right? Now, if you can get this one, you are a good friend of mine. Even if I might have not known you for long, you are my friend. The line is this. You're killing me, Smalls. Yes, baseball fans, come on somebody, go Dodgers, right? Uh, Sandlot, right, one of the greatest baseball movies ever, ever made, right? You're killing me, Smalls, right? And I find so much, like, I, I, I feel that I am Smalls. Anyways, okay, uh, <laughs> uh, how about this one, right? How about this line for probably not just our generation, but our older generation, one of the greatest movies. They may, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Braveheart. Oh, okay. We've got an old soul here, Deacon Aaron, right? Braveheart. Yes, this is one of the greatest lines. Freedom, right? 
And what is it about one-liners that really speak to us, right? It's like when you hear that one line, all the images, the emotions of you watching that film, the, the scene that kind of passed by, it all comes to mind, right? Because one-liners, they stick. And that's why pastors love to use one-liners. Come on, somebody, right? There's pastors, and we had a, we had a guest speaker or, or a pastor who came and spoke to us on Thursday, and he is, like, notorious for one-liners, right? And one of his famous one-liners, right, and this, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking to Pastor James, James Jang, right? He's single. And so, anyways, uh, his one-liner is this. It's not about the information. It's about transformation, right? And that's one of the taglines that he lives by, right? But let me just say another one-liner, some popular ones that maybe you've heard before, maybe you haven't. God doesn't call, call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Mm, come on, somebody, right? How about this one, right? God, or sorry, give Satan an inch and he will be a ruler. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, fine. How about this one? Last one and I promise I'll be done, right? Read the Bible, and you will find it scares the hell out of you. Let's pray. All right. I bet. <laughs> no, anyways, but this is, we these one-liners, right? They stick, right? There's these things about one-liners that pastors love to say, and, and especially past preachers of the generation, like there's like a one-liner that they say. But as I was reading John chapter 6, and as I was reading the last 10 verses or 11 verses of this chapter, that one line that Peter replied, Simon Peter replied to Jesus' question of, Lord, to whom shall we go for you have the words of eternal life? That stuck out to me like a one line of life. Boom. It hit me and stuck to me. And as I've been meditating through this entire chapter, chapter 6, that line just continued to come back more and more and continued to uh, come to me as a question. And then it came to me again as a statement, right? And when John, oh, I'm sorry, when, when uh, Simon Peter was saying this to the Lord, yes, the Lord was asking a question, and he wasn't replying with a question. In fact, the, he, though it was in the form of a question, it was a statement of boldness and faith, declaring to his Lord, Savior, Jesus, saying, Jesus, though everyone else left, I will remain, and, I, and not just I, but we as your people will remain, because who else can we go to? Lord, you alone are the one that we will turn to. You're the only one. Right? You're the one that we long to desire to be with for our lives because there's no one else. We can turn to other people, but you are the only one that have the words eternal life. Isn't eternal life why we have uh, such a great gift that we get to enjoy in God's kingdom? I mean, it's just the beginning, right? But it's also not the end. Eternal life is something that we get to enjoy as his people. And this is something that we, we, we uh, are... are passionate about. So we, when we do school evangelism, we go out to different people and have different uh, OJTs. If you don't know what that is, join and you will find out. But we do all these, we set this up. Why? Because we're offering to them the gift of eternal life. And so when Simon Peter recognized that Jesus truly was who he said he was, but also offered alongside that the gift of eternal life, it stuck to him and realized it doesn't matter how crazy life is going to get once I follow Jesus. Because all I know is that I'm loyal to him, and I will fully be bound to him completely. And this is the question that we really want to dive into today. Because though we see in this chapter many characters, right? We, saw the, we see 5,000 people that, that came uh, through the miracle of, or 5,000 plus, through the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. But from there, right, they received a meal. And then afterwards, as Jesus and disciples, if you see down in chapter 6, it, they, they now kind of slip away and they move on and they, they take a boat to the other side. And on that trip is where you see Jesus walking on the water, right? You see this crazy scene of Jesus walking and then they get to the other side and then guess who's waiting for them? The 5,000 people plus that, were, that just got fed are now meeting them at the other side of the lake and so we see the following of the crowds of, of these people coming and passing and going to Jesus. And then Jesus confronts this crowd and says, look, why are you following us? See, you're following us because I gave you some food to eat and you experienced a miracle. And you're coming here now again because you want, you want food for me again. But let me tell you, I have something better to give you. And he starts to introduce this idea of what it means to, for him being the bread of life and that you would eat of me and that you would drink of me. And so as he's sitting at this uh, the synagogue in Capernaum, right, he's sitting there teaching this, uh, this lesson, the people of the law, the Pharisees and the, 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 the law uh, makers and the, law, uh, the people of the law of that time were listening to Jesus' words. And as they heard him say those words, 
that uh, if you go back to this in, in, um, in verse 63, it says, it is a spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. Right before that, he starts to give this introduction of, you must eat of me, drink of my, of my blood, and then for those who do that will have eternal life, for those who will fully have my satisfying or satisfaction. And this is the, the, the it was a, it, this message was so offensive to the people and the, laws, uh, the lawmakers of that time because to them, they're thinking, what is this guy saying? First of all, we recognize he's a God who has power. He's a person who has a lot of uh, supernatural power. He just did a miracle. We experienced the provision of that miracle. We experienced his teachings, and his teachings are very, very, are very uh, different from what we've been hearing, and there's, there's an authority as he speaks. But then as soon as he starts speaking about eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood, they start to get this red flag. Obviously, for us, we read this, and we think, okay, this is obviously a symbolism. So let's go back and read that. And this is in John chapter 52, 6, verse 6, verse 52. The Bible says this. We put it on the screen. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Again, I mean, welcome to GMI. Welcome to Grace Family, right? This is where we practice cannibalism right now. I mean, so now people, I mean, if, you, if we practice that literally, it would be weird, right? It would be a cult, and I would tell you to leave the church, right? But for them, that's how they really understood it. They literally understood that Jesus is telling them that we need to eat his flesh, drink his blood. And because they were, they were thinking that Jesus was saying, okay, wait, everything up until now, I can believe. Everything up until now, I, I, I can understand what you're saying. But this right here, I'm not sure. This is weird. Now you become into a place where you're becoming a, 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 almost as if it's a false teaching and a cult. How can we eat your flesh? How can we drink your blood? But obviously, because for us, as we read it, we have the full concept of Scripture. But for them, because they were blinded by their own religiosity, they saw this, uh, this saying of Jesus as a literal saying. And for them, it was like, now you're telling us to become cannibals. Our very own Torah and law in Deuteronomy specifically says that you should not eat food that has blood in it. So if you're telling us a drink of your blood... What are you saying? Are you telling us to disobey our law? Are you telling us to get rid of that? The law that we've been living by is, is a false law now. And so now they started getting offended. And now these disciples, they weren't just followers, but these disciples that were following Jesus could not accept that message. They turned a blind eye to it. Their hearts became hardened. And as soon as Jesus said those words, they responded in offense and they responded by walking away. Could that be the case for us today too? Could that be the case for us as, as people of God that we come to church and as soon as we hear something that Pastor Shine or one of the preachers preach and we say, and it is from the scripture, but we don't agree with it, we become offended and we walk away. We start to leave the church because it doesn't fit our mold of theology. It doesn't fit our mold of what we, are supposed, we expect God to fit into. Right? We expect God to move in a certain way. We expect God to answer prayers in certain ways, in certain situations. But because he doesn't or doesn't show up in that exact moment that you prayed and asked for, does that mean that he's not real? Does that mean that he doesn't love you? And I feel that so many times that we as, as church people and what the pandemic has taught us is that Those who have had a faith in those kind of foundations, right, they've gone to that kind of truth and saying, this is the kind of God that I believe in. And as soon as the pandemic happened, it was easily given an excuse to leave the church, to go find a new church, to find another church or a ministry that fits their model, that fits their, uh, what fits to their liking and what they feel like, oh, this this is my style of teaching and preaching. Now, I understand that from GMI, we can be pretty intense. Now, don't get us wrong. 
right? We're like, we're like Apostle Peter here. We're, we're intense. We're very, like, we're very, we have a lot of emotions, but because we're very passionate, right? Jeremiah, like, we're, we're a passionate folk. We're, we're gung-ho about missions and evangelism. And so a lot of times when we, you know, we, we come off as, a, as if we're giving off a wrong message as if you can't get on board with us, then leave. That's not what we're trying to say. We're trying to show you and communicate with you that the relationship that we have with our Father, that the anointing that is given to our church is of that one of all-out missions for the gospel, Right? And this is the heart position for his people. It's not just a special gifting he's given to us. It is a calling he's given to all people, all of his people, to go into the nations, to be the light of the world, to be those that will embody and glorify God by simply saying, God, I want to take your attributes, who you are as a holy God, a loving God, a God who is full of joy, love, peace, joy, uh, Love, joy, peace, righteousness, and faithfulness, all the, the fruits of the Spirit, and embody that into my who I am and reflect that to wherever I'm called to, the context of my workplace, the context of my families. That is what it means to give God the glory. But then what we end up doing is we start to nitpick, and in our own religiosity or in our religious minds, we start to become too smart for our own good, and we start to say, okay, this is, we're picking and choosing as if it's a menu. And we're saying, okay, this is for me, this is not for me. And this is something I believe that the Lord is calling out into the church today, saying, look, if we end up, if you continue to end up in that direction, you will become like the other character that was talked about in this story, Judas Iscariot. Judas was one of, not the 5,000, he was one of the 12. He was one that God called out specifically, gave a complete, intimate calling, says, Judas, I've chosen you Come follow me. Be my disciple. He called him specifically. He wasn't just a, another 5,000, just a number. He was a name. He had a personhood. He had an identity in the scriptures. And yet for Judas, the same opportunity given to Simon Peter and all the other disciples, and for you and I, for this, for this matter, the same opportunity given to us, Judas also had as well. But why was his end result completely different than that of Peter? Peter's response here was, was from Jesus' question saying, verse 66, we can go back. He says, uh, Jesus says, after this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away also or as well? And they're giving him, he's giving them an out. And my college pastor used to always say that John chapter 6, verse 66 is the most demonic chapter in the Bible because it's John 6. Six, six. All right, tough crowd. All right, well, anyways, yeah. Uh, but this one, but it's really, this is really, uh, it is demonic because look at what's happening in verse 66. They hear the word of God, they hear the teaching, but their response is that of turning away from the Lord. There's nothing more demonic than to reject God. There's nothing more demonic than to turn away when the opportunity has been given to you and you say no. Or worse, you say yes in your flesh. But in your spirit, you want to do what you want to do. There is no obedience. There is no surrendering. There is no laying down. Because this, this is the spirit of, of Judah, or it's Judas. This is the spirit of Judas Iscariot. The spirit of rebellion. The spirit that says, I say yes on the outwardly. There's a form of godliness on the, outward, out, on, on the outside. But inwardly, there's no power. There's no substance. There's no change. There's nothing that's actually really there, Right? And this is something that I think um, is, is a question that we have to really ask ourselves. Who, to whom will we go? Because if we answer that question correctly and we, we answer it with our lives, to whom we will go, it will be revealed, right? Just like the parable of those who build their house on the, the, the rocky, uh, or on the, on the rock and those on the sand. At the end times, when the troubles will come, when the storms of life come, it reveals to you who you went to. Right? It reveals to you whom you will go. Do you go to Jesus, your, your Lord and Savior, the foundation for your life? Or do you go to an idea of Jesus, a form of Jesus? You accept the teachings of him and you accept the principalities and, and even you accept his, um, the, the rewards or the, the, the benefits of following him. And yet the relationship aspect of there is completely not there. It's so sad to see so many people that are doing the church activity, the ins and outs, the weekend activity, but then when, when the difficult seasons come, and we need those difficult seasons, those, those people that I, that I would soon see as faith or heroes of the faith or whatnot, the substance is actually revealed, 
right? The, the reality or the strength of the relationship is now being shown, right? We see that the hidden sin in their lives was actually the thing that they ran to instead of Jesus. To whom shall we go? Should we go to our secret sins? Should we go to our love of money? Do we go to the different ideologies of the world? Do we go to different, maybe even personality tests, right? Sometimes we, we like, people have made huge deals of like Enneagrams and MBTI and, and all these different things of trying to know who we are, but you can't truly know who you are until you are in Christ. The identity that you have in him becomes revealed more and more the, the longer you walk with him, right? This is why it's a joy, it's a blessing for you that you would know the Lord now in this life, not later in your life, because as you know the Lord here, now early in your life, you begin to grow into your eternal identity. You start to grow into who you are supposed to be in heaven and on earth, the new heaven and kingdom that is to come. You get to embody that and reflect that here on earth. Yes, you are in a shell. Yes, that we are in a, in a restricted prison of, a, of our flesh and we continue are prone to sin, but this is good. It's good because it continues to show us that we need God, right? Because if you were to live sinless, if you were to have all the control and power you had in the world, then you would not need any room for the Lord in your life. God has no room for you for him to speak and, and, and say something and give a, a word of obedience or, or give a word of instruction. And there would be no obedience on your end because for us, we've already decided in our hearts, I know what's best for myself. And this is the reality and sad reality of our country today. Not only our country, but even the churches. We've seen our country now currently running itself into the ground because people in the name of freedom want to continue to project their ideas of what it is to be a freedom in Christ or free in Christ or to, to, to have churches that would that talk about certain political issues, uh, to have certain views that need to be agenda, like uh, uh, you know, prioritized and have an agenda towards that. What other agenda is there than Jesus Christ, right? Again, don't get me wrong. Yes, there is room for justice. There is room for mercy. But it's not, it should not be something that is covered in the name of religiosity or in the name of freedom in Christ if Christ is not there. And for us as people, if we are not waking up into this, then we will slowly become like the, one of the 5,000 just amongst the crowd, get offended, and leave. Or worse, you are in the church. You are the one of the 12 that God has invited personally to be a part of his inner crowd or his squad, and then you follow, have the same opportunity just like Judas did, but at the end, the result is not, is not what you would hope for. The difference we have to understand here is this. The heart condition of the disciples, especially Peter and the disciples, the heart condition was completely different from that of the 5,000 and also of Judas, right? To Peter and the disciples, nobody could replace Jesus as their master. Only Jesus. Jesus was the only person that they would give their full loyalty and allegiance to, right? For just to name a few, Jesus, right, was their teacher. As the Bible says in John 6, 68, you have the words of life eternal, right? He says, you, you Lord, are the one that we choose because you have the words of eternal life. So he was their teacher. Jesus was their shepherd, right? The Bible says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Who else could do that for his disciples? No rabbi would ever do that for his students, right? But our good shepherd does. Jesus was their lamb. John the baptizer said of Jesus, uh, um, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, Nobody else could be a sacrifice to make atonement for the disciples, only Jesus. Jesus was also their way. I am the way, John says in, four, uh, uh, in John, uh, chapter 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He is the way for them, right? And lastly, Jesus was their God, right? He was their God. Thomas said to Jesus in John 10, 20, 28, my Lord and my God. What other man could the disciples recognize as God? See, there's a portion in, in our salvation story that should to come to a point in, our, in a conjunction of our lives that first that we accept Jesus as our, as our Savior. We recognize that he has died on the cross. He is the perfect sacrifice in sin and atonement for our iniquities. But secondly, there is this portion where we accept Jesus as our Lord. In other words, you're saying, Jesus, whatever you call me to do, whatever you instruct me, I've surrendered that completely unto you. I've given up my right to make a decision for myself. I've given up my right to say, I know what's best for me, but I surrender that right to you because I know that whatever you say, whatever you want me to go, 
that's the best choice for me. That's the best option for me. And that is what, to say, what, is, what is to say that the Lord, that Jesus is my Lord, right? One pastor said this one-liner. Here's a one-liner for you. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all, right? Mm, come on, somebody, right? One-liner, right? But this is the truth. Understanding that if Jesus is not your Lord, you're going to find your life in this complete uh, just depression and, and, and disconnection from the Lord because you're realizing why isn't it making sense of what I'm hearing and what I'm doing, right? You've, what, what you've done, right, in this place, in this chapter is you've carried your, you've put upon yourself the spirit of Judas Iscariot, right? And then don't get me, you know, if you get offended, okay, that's not my intention, but good, maybe the Lord is trying to speak to you. What I'm trying to say is, maybe today, maybe for me, and this is something I have to ask, ask myself too, is am I becoming more and more like a Pharisee or like Judas, or am I becoming more like Jesus? If Jesus were to come down and look upon our church, would he see upon believers that says, wow, look at them. They look just like me. They act, they talk, they speak, they, they, they obey just like me. They think the way just like me, or... Are they just like the Pharisees of the time? The, 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 the people the, that, that knew that they thought better. Or the Judas Iscariots of the time. That people who had a form of God, uh, uh, godliness but had no power. What would Jesus say? What would he say to you? What would be your response? The difference here is the heart condition. As I was preparing this message, I felt a... Uh, um, a grace to speak directly to some of us that are here, because I know many of us here are, are those that serve in our EDU department, right? There are two crowds, there are two people that the Lord was revealing to me. Number one was those who are serving in our education department, those that be in the youngest, right, from the, from the children all the way up to the college ministry, right, and anything in between. That for you, my question to you is this, is what are you actually giving to your students, you're serving them, what is it actually offering? What are you doing to them? Are you just offering to them good memories? I mean, yes, those are all part of it. Those are all side effects of it and side benefits. But if there is no real substance into what you're giving to your, the people you serve, then what's the point? Why are you there? Are you only in that ministry because there's a longing in your heart that wants to be satisfied? Perhaps there's a desire for you to want community. That's not a bad longing, but if that longing is prioritized before you being a servant of God, then there's a fault there. My challenge, my, my calling to some of us that are here serving in the department is these children are so much more worth our time and our investment that we should give them something worthwhile, amen? Shouldn't we give them something that is worth having a substance of so that when they go, go through their lives, they don't walk out of here thinking, okay, I left junior high ministry, I left high school ministry with a lot of great memories, but who is Jesus? Again, it's not your responsibility for them to have the relationship, but at least you can at least inspire them. The one thing that you can give to them is that you personally show them how much in love you are with the Lord. Right? I've said this many times to my leaders that have come through my junior high ministries, and you've, if you've served this under Pastor June, you've heard this saying as well. The best thing that you can do for your students, and I'm going to say this to your parents as well, the best thing that you can say, do for your parents is that first and foremost, you have a vibrant relationship with the Lord. If you don't have a relationship with God, you have nothing to give, right? For me, it's just something that I have to come to at the end of myself, recognizing what else do I have to give to my son, Theo, other than a spiritual inheritance? Isn't that the only thing that I want to pass on to him? I mean, yes, I want to set up on this life. Sure, it'd be great if I could set up good finances for him, a home to live in, some equity for him to live on for, right, and build on. But is that all? Isn't there something greater that I can pass on? Isn't the spiritual inheritance that I can pass on to my next generation, isn't that worthwhile? Isn't that the substance that I want the next generation to know that the Lord is truly Lord of all, that he was Lord of my life, he was someone that I live for completely, and to trust in him, isn't that so much more worthwhile to give and pass on to the next generation than just good memories, than just having some sleepovers and lock-ins and whatnot? I'm asking us to reevaluate how we view our, our service to the Lord, how we view ourselves in the position of leadership we're in. For those that are here that, that are in that position, I really ask you to, to uh, ask yourself this question, who do you go to? To whom do you go? Because if you don't, 
If you uh, don't ask yourself that question, you might end up finding yourself in the path of Judas rather than the path of Peter. Now look, Peter, he didn't, get, he didn't have it all figured out either, right? If for all we know, he was a very passionate, emotional wreck, but there's one thing that we know about him. He was one loyal dude, right? Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? He was one loyal dude. He was someone that said, Jesus, you've got all of me, right? And sometimes he would say things like, you know, he didn't really fully understand what he was saying, but he would say certain things and get too ahead of himself. But there's one thing you couldn't deny was that he truly was loyal to Jesus, which is why he went as, as far as saying, Jesus, how could you tell me I was gonna be, I'm going to betray you? Like, there's never a chance that I would ever betray you. And yet when that actually happened, he was probably so shocked. But his response was, but I know, my, I know my God, I know my Father, that there's still room for grace and mercy as I'm here and living. For Judas, his response, he betrayed Jesus too. But he had also the same opportunity for the same room of grace, love, and forgiveness. But his response was not to come to Jesus, but rather to go and demise and, and to hang himself and to eventually die. The response, we have the, we have the opportunity to change how our story ends. Some of us, you're coming into this story right now, and, there, and you're at this place where you're like, I don't know if I can even go a little further. I just, I need some hope. I was meeting some people right, uh, re recently, this one mom who recently really needed some counseling and some love and just some just words of life to be poured into, their li into, her, into her life. And she was saying, I just, I need, I need something. I need someone, right? And at that moment, I started to share the gospel and tears started breaking down her, her, her eyes because she realized, I grew up as a Catholic. I understood what the gospel was, but I never really experienced it for, for me personally. That's the same thing that happened to Judas. He heard the gospel. He, he saw the miracles. He even did the miracles. He even went out and was a representation of, or a one who represented Christ and did the miracles on his behalf. And yet, still... He did not have a personal experience with the gospel. He did not have a personal experience of, uh, uh, with Jesus Christ. But all those years, he had an opportunity. He could just pull Jesus aside and be like, Jesus, I'm sure you already know this, but man, I'm struggling. I have some secret sins. You know what, you know what um, Judas' secret sin was? He was a thief. When people would give offerings, he would put his hand into the offering basket and take some money. That was his secret sin. He would allow that sin to grow and harvest and continue to be impregnated by this, and then eventually it would, cause, it would come to the end of his life. That secret sin of thievery, he could have confessed, been clean, and be completely healed of, but as he was with the Savior, walking with him, not a 5,000, one of those 5,000 that just saw him from afar. No, I'm talking about 12 right beside him, sleeping with him, eating with him, walking with him, talking with him, and yet all those opportunities and moments of chances to get right with him, never once did he confess. And sometimes we do, we do the same exact thing. We come and come again, over and over again, and yet God is giving opportunities. Get right with me. I love you. I want to show you my grace. I want to show you my mercy. Is there an opportunity for us to get right with the Lord? I want to end by talking about what this spirit of, of Judas Iscariot is. And I also want to identify a few warnings for us so we know if we're falling into this. Firstly, what is the spirit of Judas Iscariot? The spirit of, the, the spirit of Judas Iscariot is this. It is the spirit of rebellion rooted in security, clothed in religion. Let me say that again. It is the spirit of rebellion rooted in insecurity and clothed in in religion. Last week, Pastor Sam talked about that, right? The spirit of religiosity, the spirit of religion. This spirit has something that I believe has impregnated the church, has come in, and there's something that's, that's, that's growing in the church that should not belong there, right? And that's this religious spirit of approaching the Lord in, a, in an autonomous way. What I mean by that is, is that you approach God in your individual way, how you see fit, and if the Lord doesn't move in the way you do, you seek autonomy, and you start to want to do things the way that you see fit, and you want to be separated from God. You say, God, look, you can speak into my life, but in this specific area, maybe it's finances, maybe it's marriage, maybe it's relationship, right? You, don't have, you can't speak into that. That's my right. That's my right. I have a claim to that. 
And God is saying, no, but that's what I want because that one thing is what's going to give me the full total surrender, full total obedience before me. So Judas, right, uh, is, was drowning, I believe, in his insecurities. I think he sunk deeper the more he walked with Jesus. Um, I think Judas really loved to be seen, right? I got to confess, it's pretty nice to be seen, right? Isn't it pretty nice when you get recognized by somebody, when you get noticed? It is something that it, it makes you feel good in, on the fleshly level too. But I think Judas was really just wrapped around in that idea. Like, you know, when you get noticed at work, you get a promotion, right? Maybe you got promoted just recently to a manager. Or maybe you got promoted or you got a raise. Like, that makes you feel, like, good, right? Doesn't it? Doesn't it make you feel like, man, I feel noticed. I feel like all my hard work that I'm doing is actually paying off, and I feel really, really seen there. But then let me ask you the question is, how long does that last? You get raised two bucks more. Maybe you got a new position. How long does that position, or how long that, that, does that last? And for Judas, I think he liked the fact that he was seen. First, called by God. And then, I'm sure as he's walking with Jesus... Right, and going from miracle to miracle, I'm sure the crowd got bigger and bigger, and people started recognizing that's Judas. He's one of the 12 apostles. He's part of Jesus' inner circle. I'm sure he started hearing all these things and these words, and it started to puff up his head and realizing, oh, I'm significant. I'm relevant. I've got some authority here. I'm starting to become someone recognized. You know, Bible historians say that before Jesus called Judas into his, into his uh, discipleship in one of the 12, they say that he was actually one of the close followers and disciples of John the Baptist. Now, when I read that, I saw that, immediately I thought, I know what Judas is. Judas is a crowd follower. He likes to go where the crowd is, right? And you know, as, he was, as I recognized that, I realized, I'm Judas. I, I love following the crowd too sometimes. Especially growing up, I enjoyed, you know, especially when there were like fights on the campus and you just run the camp like, oh, what's going on? Like, what's going on? And you just follow the crowd, right? And then I always admired other people, right? People that would stand out and be different because they, were, they had the boldness and the courage to be different, right? Like, for example, one of those guys to me, for me personally, my personal life is Pastor Sam, right? Pastor Sam, he's just different to me. The way he thinks about certain situations, the way he even looks is different, right? I'm telling you, it's a good way, right? But he just is a different just kind of person, and I always admire that about him. It's like, wow, there's a boldness, that really a genuine boldness there. And I desired, as he realized, as he continued to become more like Christ, I desired to want more of that as well. And Judas was probably like that. I think he got more insecure the more he was around his apostles, his other brothers. He started to re recognize, wow, look at Peter. Look at the transformation that's happening within his life. Man, he's really changing. Wow, well, look, look, at, look at over here, look at Thomas. You look at him. Look at, look, at, look at over here. Look at you know, all these other disciples that are, that are being transformed. But what about me? I'm, I don't know, God. I'm too, I'm too ashamed to come out of my sin and to confess that I'm dealing, that I'm actually stealing from the money, from, from the, the offering basket. I mean, honestly, if they confess, if he confessed that, that's a pretty shameful thing, right? People would probably, he would probably feel really guilty the fact that he actually took money for his own gain, for his, to, to fill his own needs. And if he were to confess that, I'm sure there would be a lot of backlash, right? Now, this is where I want to end and con come to a conclusion. I think Judas, right, had the right longing for truth in life, but he instead rooted himself in the crowd, in the trend, in the, 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 the thing that was popularized or contextualized for relevancy, rather than actually rooting himself in, in uh, Jesus Christ alone. He never personalized faith. He never allowed the faith that he encountered with the Lord to become personally, personal to him. People who are of the spirit of Judas are gospel-hardened. What I mean by that is they read the words of Jesus and they don't apply them to themselves. They always say that applies to that person, that person, the people next to me, but then it doesn't apply to themselves, right? Uh, for example, the example is that for him in the, in the story of the alabaster jar, right, when Mary broke that jar and anointed the feet of Jesus, Judas was the one that uproared and said in, 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 you know, in defense, saying, why would you waste such a precious and valuable perfume? We could have sold that and given it to the poor. Religion. That was a relationship. That wasn't intimacy with Jesus. If he really knew the heart of Jesus, then he would have not have said anything about 
a, um, an act of duty or, or a good deed, of a religious deed of serving other people. Sure, it's a great thing to do to serve other people and those in need. Yeah, that's what God wants us to do. But in that moment, he missed what, what was actually happening. He didn't understand why, because his heart was completely crowded by the sin and the rebellion of the spirit of that age. He was completely overrun by his private sin that eventually led to him betraying Jesus. People who are of the spirit of, spirit of, uh, the spirit of Judas Iscariot are blind to their own condition. Pride, arrogance, rebellion, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed, and a host of other sinful personality traits sear the conscious mind. The sins that a person goes on committing deceives them into believing they are they are a privileged character, right? And they can, they can get by with almost anything that they do while expecting others to like it. They, they assume this position of, of, um, of authority and honor saying, like, look, I belong to Jesus Christ. I can do what I want. Like this, to him, he thought his ticket into heaven was, I'm one of the apostles. But that was a false religion. He was blinded by his own rebellion. People who are of Judas Iscariot's spirit are risking their everlasting soul for some temporal pleasure. I ask you this today. Do you find yourself more resembling that of Judas? Is your heart condition becoming more and more in that area? Because these are the telltale signs of, of warnings to you that our hearts would not become hardened and become like Judas, but rather let it be vibrant. Let it be like that of Simon Peter who says, Lord, I give you my full loyalty. Even if I don't understand everything in my mind, the theology isn't fully formed. It's okay. All that he requires is a loyalty and a faith that says, Lord, I trust you and you alone. If I can ask the praise team to come up at this time. I want to give you guys three warning signs of how to protect yourself from this uh, spirit of, of of Judas Iscariot. The first one is, is recognizing and asking the Lord, Lord, is there any private sin in my life? Is there a secret sin? I've talked about this before. Is there a secrecy in the way that I'm living? Am I continuously living and trying to attain the power of God, but yet on the outside, it's just a form of godliness. It's godliness on the outside, but it's godlessness on the inside. There's nothing there to, there's nothing of worth of substance. There's nothing the Lord sees and is pleased by which is why we must continuously pray, Lord, as King David said, search me and know me and see if there be anything wicked in me. That prayer re keeps us uh, grounded. That prayer keeps us stabilized in his grace because it doesn't allow us to go too beyond his love, but it continues to keep us remained right in the moment where the Lord can do something with our obedience. He can do something with our simple obedience if we just remain in that humility and that humble mindset of, Lord, would you please search me and know me and see if there's anything wicked in me. This is something that we must recognize as a warning sign. Is there any private sin in your life that you have still not confessed? Secondly, I want to say is that there is a, there is a love for money, right? Judas, again, he was one who managed the the the. the offering purse. But because he managed it, it continued to give him the temptation to sneak in, take some money. In other words, his love for money was greater than his love for Jesus. Though the, though the truth was right there, though the way was right in front of him, what was blinding him was his desire for money. This desire, and you know what money signifies? It signifies power. It signifies control. It signifies that, it symbolizes that if you have more money, that means you have the power and control to provide for your own life the way that you think that you should be provided for. When we've recognized that God is our main provider, and this is something that I pray all the time for my son every time I put him to sleep, I say, Lord, would you be the hand that clothes him, feeds him, and provides for him? That you be the one, because God. I can provide for him. I can work at church. I can work another job and make money, and then I can buy clothes for him. I can feed him, feed him food. But at the end of the day, all of that is temporary. The one thing, Lord, that God, that, that, that is lasting is what you give to him. So, Lord, all my efforts may simply go into a spiritual inheritance that says, God, I want to pass on to the next generation something worth of value, something that has substance and it will test 
the test, uh, uh, pass the test of time that continues as it becomes, as we become persecuted in our faith, as we see the church continuously being bombarded by different uh, angles of, of the enemy's schemes, that there is a substance to our relationship because we know what it is to belong to the Lord and to have Him in us. See, what it means to, re- to eat of the Lord and to receive Him, uh, to drink of Him, is exactly what we do on the daily. When you eat your food and you drink your drink, it becomes a part of your body. The nutrients, whatever the, the, whatever the things that are in that uh, the food that you ate, it becomes a part of you. Your body grows, expands, or even becomes more sculpted by what you eat and what you drink. In the same way, when we allow the Holy Spirit, when we say, Lord, I want to eat of you and drink of you, it is a literal saying, I want my, phys- my spiritual body to change, to grow, to be sculpted, to be, to be whatever that is that you desire for me to be because I am, in, the, in a sense, assimilating myself with you. There is this con, uh, con, uh, uh, joining together of a connection of a genuine saying, you are now a part of me. Therefore, Paul says, the life I now live, I don't live in my own flesh. I live in the Spirit, right? It's, it's He who lives through me because that is the power now we get to have as believers. Some of us, we continue to try to live our lives in our flesh, which continues to cause us to go into loneliness and depression. And if there's anything the pandemic has taught us is that we need community, right? And more than community in terms of friends, we need a relationship with God. We truly need a live, vibrant relationship with the Lord. I'm calling us today, if you have lacked in a relationship with Him, if, you, if it's been hard for you to hear the voice of God, go run to Him again. Run to the Word and let the Word of God fill you. Literally eat the Word of God. Let it be something that you consume. Let it be something that you digest. Drink of his blood. In other words, the forgiveness of his sins. Run to repentance and continue to repent upon the sins that you have committed in your thoughts, in your omissions and commission. That you will be a people that are not saying a repentance is a one-time thing, but it is an everyday lifestyle saying, God, I need your forgiveness because I am a sinner by nature and I need you. My spiritual body will not be sucked dry because of my sinful flesh. Lord, I need you. Lord, would you come and be a part of my life? Lastly, the third warning, right? It was private sin, the love for money. And lastly is, do you find yourself becoming very selfish? Or in other words, you're you're a collector. You like to hoard things. That you find yourself hard to give away. You're giving away, either it be money, giving away your time, your, your energy. If you find yourself not willing to give, then there's something happening within your heart condition. That maybe your heart is becoming and leaning more towards the hardenedness, right? And let me remind you, the people in the Bible that were categorized as people with hardened hearts, number one was Pharaoh. Another people were, at times, the the Israelites who disobeyed God. Others were the Jewish people, the, the, the Pharisees, right? These are people that are of hardened hearts, we can easily find ourselves, and let's not become naive to think that we'll never become like that. No, in fact, the enemy is lying to you and telling you, oh no, just continue to go your way of religiosity and continue to to approach the Lord in religion, and then you'll be okay. No, that's not true. That's a lie from the enemy. Break that spirit of religion. Break the spirit of Judas Iscariot that is upon the church of Jesus Christ right now, and then we will come against that scheme and say, Lord, set us free. Set us free from this spirit that we will be set free for you so that we may live for your kingdom. Can I get an amen? If I can ask us to stand to our feet. The questions I want to ask you, again, in closure is, to whom could we go? Who or what are the places that you could run to? Ask the Lord to help you recognize the false places of identity and foundations that you've ran to. Is it your own wisdom? Is it a form of godliness? Is it religion? To whom could you go? And then you ask yourself, to whom should we go? And then hopefully we can be at a position of what Peter is. Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the only person worth giving our all to. You are the only one worth investing all of ourselves into. Lord, may you be the one that makes, uh, makes yourself bigger in my life.
want to end by this testimony, but you know, last uh, couple weeks, um, I was invited, and by uh, a lot of our second generation pastors were invited to go to our church's denominational pastors gathering. And this is, like, this is a denomination gathering for only the senior pastors and lead pastors of all the churches across uh, globally and domestically here that are from our denomination. And this is a time for them to have a, a break, a time of rest. But for some reason, right, for the last couple of years, our senior pastor and some of the other senior pastors as well felt the need to start inviting the younger pastors, start inviting me. Again, I have no right to be here. I have no claim to be in that room. Right? I am not a senior pastor. I have not labored nearly as enough as, have, as they have. And even some of our pastors that have been serving here in the KM side for about 13, 15 years, this is their first time going. This past uh, trip was their first time going within that time, 15 years. I've only been here serving for maybe, what, six, seven years? And within that time, I've been invited three times. I, have, I felt so ashamed and so guilty that I didn't take it more seriously. I, took, I felt so ashamed that I did not understand the opportunity that was given to me. But this time, something changed. Something was different. Because not only did they extend the invitation to me, but they also extended it to my wife and to my son, right? They allow, allowed it to be a family thing, right? Usually, it's, it causes a lot of stress, right? There's a lot of more logistics that are involved when you're traveling with kids, especially other, other people. And obviously, this is a vacation for the senior pastors, but they invited the family and kids, and I understood the heart where they were trying to get at. They're saying, for 30, 40 plus years, we have been laboring, we have been investing, we have been, we have been fervently seeking the kingdom of God. But now, we're literally holding out in front of you the baton. The image that I get is in the Olympics this past summer, there was, as, as Japan was a host nation, there was a scene where the torch was being passed from one group to another. And in this scene, there was the oldest generation in, in Japan's history was passing the torch, and it was the youngest generation. That spoke so profoundly, right? If the world could get that message, why can't the church? If the world could understand what it is to pass the baton, why can't we take the responsibility and the opportunity in front of us to take a hold of the baton and continue to go forward, right? And if we fail to take the baton, guess what happens? Our next generation suffers. My children, my son, your sons and your daughters will get to, will have to face the consequences for our failure to not take the baton. The people, the days of judges is exactly what happened then as well. There was a generation that raised up and because their previous fathers and mothers did not follow the Lord and did not continue to show who the Lord was, that generation grew up not knowing who God was, not even having any kind of uh, wherewithal of who God was. And I do not want that to be the case for our next generation. Can I get an amen? It is our duty. It is our responsibility. Church, today, we are the now generation. There is no more. We are, we are not the next generation. We are the now generation. It's time for us to now take the baton and go and move forward. Because if we don't, our children will suffer from it. The offsprings, the, 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 the students that we teach and lead, they will suffer from it. So I want to call us to a time of prayer and repentance, first and foremost. Lord, would you come and find in me anything that is wicked, anything that is not of you. Reveal that to me so that, God, I want to be right with you. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak into our hearts. May we be a generation that says, God, we want to say yes to you. We want to simply take the baton and the mantle and say, Lord, lead this next generation. We give you our full obedience and trust. Let's come before the Lord right now. Let's call the name of Jesus on three. Let's call upon his name. And with prayer, with fervency, with genuineness in our hearts, God, would you come and remove the spirit of rebellion upon our generation. Let's pray together right now. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.